Good evening. Uh, I would like to welcome you all uh, at another edition of our uh, program called Curating Institution, which we uh, like to introduce uh, the questions regarding the critical uh, art institutions, if they are possible in a global art circulation. And tonight, guests, uh, which I'm really honored um, personally and as an institution, uh, were to host uh, Chris Grüthusen, uh, director and curator at the Kunstwerke Institute of Contemporary Art in Berlin since 2016. So, uh, uh, very fresh. And tonight, uh, uh, Chris will uh, share with us. Uh, his perspective on the program of uh, uh, Kunstwerke uh, on 2017. And so the title of tonight's uh, um, uh, lecture, uh, which I propose, is Participation as a strat uh, Critical Strategy, Kunstwerke Institute of Contemporary Art in Berlin. Without further ado, Chris, the floor is yours, uh, and enjoy the lecture. Thank you, Conrad. So I need to hold the microphone like this, right? And that's a plan. Then that's a plan. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody, and thanks for coming. Um, just very briefly to introduce myself. Um, yeah, so my name is Christ Gruyter. I'm Dutch, and um, my background is an artist, which I think is always interesting to say because that also makes you look at things differently. And um, since 2016, um, I was asked to take over the uh, restructuring of KW. I call, always call it KW when I speak English, but, but it's, actually, it's actually an interesting point, which I was thinking about this morning, that I've never spoken into an institution that's basically the same in many ways, and it's not in many ways, but it also has the same sort of... Uh, uh, development, uh, which was in the early 90s uh, to late 90s, of these enormous establishments of ICAs and CCAs worldwide, which was a sort of idea of trying to uh, create a sort of cross-disciplinary understanding of what arts is and how art could be perceived. Um, but I always, for me, it was always very strange to, I still have not, ha don't really have a good answer for that, why one is called Cent for Contemporary Art and one is called Institute for Contemporary Art. Now, institute, of course, always sort of applies to a way of like more pedagogical, educational format. When I was talking to a colleague of mine who directs or is the chief curator of um, Garage in, uh, in uh, Moscow, uh, she told me that they have to call it a museum because people in Russia don't understand institute. Because if you use the word institute, then that basically applies that you're either an academic, like an academia, basically. So the way of communicating to the audience only operates if you're called museum. And I think that actually applies to a lot of places in the world, including Berlin, you know. Uh, Kunstwerke, as it used to be called, uh, um, which later on, as on purposely uh, to be part of this international conversation, Klaus Biesebach, the founding director of the institution, uh, changed it to KW, Institute for Contemporary Art, and only communicated in English. So this was, of course, very provocative in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ever-changing city, which still, still tries to hold on to the German language, even though it has an enormous international uh, profile. So it was sort of a statement from, uh, from, from his side. Now, um, I'm mixing everything up. I just wanted to just quickly explain this to you. Um, I'm sure most of you know I, it's arrogant to say, but let's hope that most of you in the audience knows uh, what the institution is. But it's, um, it was founded um, in 1991, and um, it uh, had different locations at first, and um, it then basically came to the margin factor in where we are today. Um, I think KW is the par exemple of gentrification. And we started this year uh, a three-year-long critical research on how to get the better of gentrification, which is led by one of our curators, Tirdal Solgader. 
So it's a way to critically look at what the function of the institution is and what the institution has done to the neighborhood and how the neighborhood is not a neighborhood because the issue of course at Mita is that because of the wall, it was specifically the, the, the cities that were, of the cities, the streets that were close to the, to the wall were not really you know, occupied. So never got into a sort of neighborhood feel to it and just got very rapidly commercialized because Berlin needed a center. So, you know, it's kind of part with, uh, with several other initiatives uh, in the development of, of the eastern part of, of Berlin. Now, one of the elements that uh, became quite crucial for the institution was the Berlin Biennial, which was founded in 1998. And uh, the Berlin Biennial, which you could also say is a way to explore the city, but also, again, a format of possible gentrification, also a way to always be criticized for it, became much more... Um, became at one point more important than the institution itself. So the institution was organizing the Berlin Biennial, but the Berlin Biennial was the, the face internationally uh, uh, for, for, for many different reasons. And um, now KW, I'm, maybe it's a bit boring to say this, but I think it's interesting, just quickly. KW and Berlin Biennial were completely you know, intertwined. Um, so you have to imagine that when you have a Berlin Biennial coming up, then the KW Institute is all geared up to a biennial for a year, which means that the institution itself becomes sort of a, the second hand part of the focus of the staff. So the staff has to put on hats all the time. Oh wait, I work for Berlin Biennial and I work for KW. So in order to finally get a bit of, um, a bit of focus and, 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 and air to the institution, um, after a three year long negotiation with the city, uh, we, they managed that we, they managed to um, uh, free it up basically and create two directors. So I'm basically a, uh, a result of a restructuring of the organization. So you have uh, the overall organization which is called Kunstwerke Berlin and then it has two departments which is KW Institute of Contemporary Art which I direct and then you have the Berlin Biennial, which is directed by Gabriel Horn, who used to direct both. So now it's a bit of a, a different shift. And I think it's important also to see if all the things that we're working on and what we're working towards in the, in the next years. Now, what I wanted to do today, which is maybe also nice because it's January, Happy New Year. Um, uh, today is the day, which is the 19th of January. It's exactly a year ago where we opened our new program. So I thought it was a nice way to just, I mean, I'm not gonna walk you through everything that we did because we did a whole lot of things, but I'm gonna just, you know, show you bits and pieces of things and see at one point after 45 minutes if we're all um, maybe exhausted or maybe you wanna know more and I have more. Um, but there's many different layers of, of, of how the institution is constructed. Now, let me get a zip first. Now, one of the things that, um, this is basically the third time that I, I direct an institution. Um, I initiated an organization in Amsterdam called Kunstverein, and later on um, I, took, I took over the master course at the Sandberg Institute and uh, became director of the Grazer Kunstverein in, uh, in, in Graz. And, and with, each, um, with each institution or format, I kind of look at the essence and look at the look at the function of, of the institution and in which way you could strip it and in which way you can also see what the function could be besides the usual way of how you approach institution, which is by saying they do exhibitions. And um, what I did is I just looked, uh, looked, looked, looked through the past and the first thing I did is I realized that KW was 25 years old <laughs> and nobody actually told us. So. Um, then I said we should celebrate this because we're 25 years old. So the first thing we did was we did a celebration in uh, November, a year and a half, or I guess like a year and a few months ago. And uh, also for me, in order to kind of, I wouldn't say close, but as a way to, to move forward, because you have to understand that, and I think in that case, I think it's interesting to speak in this institution, is that you're pretty much haunted by the past. So people always interview you and talk to you about the past. You know, they talk about a certain kind of moment in which the institution flourished in a specific period in a city that was heavily under development and the function of, and the possibilities of this institution was very clear. Um, so I was kind of thinking about, okay, how can you include the past as a way to look into the future? And um, 
and by doing so, um, also create establish a program that kind of maybe in a almost pretentious way um, starts at the beginning of what is the function of an institution by looking through the lens of the artist. So I have to say what's extremely important with me, that's why I'm, I'm not a deeply discursive individual, is that um, I would like, and this is what we're doing at KW, that everything that we do is filtered through the lens of the artist. So that's why we're not having an enormous amount of symposia and all these sort of things. It's very much geared through this idea of an extra, an extra lens that I would like to put back onto the institution. Um, specifically because Berlin is a city of people. It's not a city of beautiful buildings, beautiful institutions. I mean, yes, they all have, they're all there, but in the end it's a city of people and that's exactly what makes Berlin so interesting. You know, because, because of this fabric, because of the unknown, or because of the accumulation of people that move there. So, an institution like KW, specifically in the development of this, of this, of this city, I think becomes more and more crucial as a vehicle to give these artists, not all have to be based in Berlin, but at least to give them that enormous voice and in a very sort of over the top ambitious way. So not fast, but in a way that an enormous investment is, is placed into their, into, their, into their lap. So there's a lot of possibilities because I think specifically in the age we live in now, institutions like, like KW are a rare gem and we need to treasure these institutions. You know, they need to have that complete freedom where experiment is number one and failure is just part of that. So it's not only about a constant form of success, whatever that is defined by visitor numbers, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, so I kind of wanted to place back the emphasis on an artist-driven program and uh, uh, also look at the building in a very different way. So one of the first things I did is, is redirect uh, the building. Um, uh, we were, uh, we're undergoing in the next two, three years, like we've done in the last 25 years, and another enormous renovation. And with renovation, you also discover a lot of things. Uh, because, I mean, I, uh, which I also said to, uh, uh, to the board, is the way I can only program an institution is by being very intuitive and being very personal, you know? So in a way of how I, how did I feel towards this institution when I visited? What annoyed me? What did I like? How would I, you know, like in a very sort of way and see if that feeling that I have, if that could be tested as a more sort of general way, but maybe it's also good that some things are just very personal in that sense. So um, the first thing I did is I, I redirected the entrance. So if you, if you go to KW now, it's not, it used to be with these big double doors, it's now in the side space. Um, which it was always uh, um, established as a project space. Now, if there's something, in all respect to tonight, <laughs> if there's something that I really do not believe in, it's project spaces. So, you know, for me, it's like whether you're 19 years old and an enormous talent, you get a big solo show, you're not getting a little room in, uh, in the institution. So I immediately killed that, and we built, uh, we built this new entrance. Now, in the new entrance, there was also KW and Berlin Biennial have published over 50 books in the last 25 years, and they're not visible. Um, so we build a bookstore, and the bookstore hosts, of course, all the books that we produced, but also um, uh, has a very specific selection related to the, pro to the program. Now, this is nothing new, but you know, as uh, publishing is an enormous important part of my curatorial interest, I really wanted this idea of like coming in and having more than just exhibitions. And also very pragmatic things like lockers, you know, where you can put your jacket. You know, there were no lockers or nothing. So you'll see that we, we changed it and we removed some walls and, and we kind of used, started using the building and opening it up. So I removed all the, all the walls and kind of worked from left to right uh, to, to, to use this uh, space uh, architecturally different. It also has a way to decentralize this idea of how you can curate. Because if you have two entrances, because we open now also the right side of the of the staircase, you have to think spatially completely different. You know, you don't think through the lens like they come in like here, and then you know normally you go from right from the from the right to the left. But in this case, you have to think, oh, they could also come in from here, and they could come in from here. And I think that that's a that's an interesting way of making uh, you know making complexities of how you can um, curate things. Now. Um, the way the program is, the way the program works is that it's actually, it stacks shows on top of each other. They're always solo shows. Um, 
In some cases, those solo shows can become a grouped format, but they're always geared through, again, the lens of certain uh, characters that we consider to be important to be looked at. And the reasons can be completely different, as long as we consider this to be contemporary conversation. Now, contemporary conversation doesn't mean that you're 25. You can be as 75, and you all know that. You can be as contemporary as, as it is. But it is specifically important that the selection of what's being made is that you can contribute something to a practice uh, by giving visibility to it or by investing into the first new proper production. Many, many different reasons why you do so. But for us, it was specifically important to bring them in dialogue with one another by giving them solos, but then stacked on top of each other. So the way the program at KW unfolds is it's written um, gradually, but it's written in a group show format, although nobody would ever see it like that. So there's like, everybody would get their own solos, but still there is a sort of specific curatorial frame for this. The last thing, and then I go into uh, showing you images, etc. Uh, what was also important for me is to decentralize uh, the name, the curator. Uh, we used to have a chief curator format, and therefore we had a director format, but it was always geared to one name and one lens. And I wanted to kind of get rid of that, so I hired more curators that have different functions and different relationships to the institution. So um, together with me, uh, Anna Gritz curates the building, and then uh, Mason Lever Yap uh, is appointed as associate curator, and um, uh, she takes care of uh, moving image productions. So they, so we invest in. Uh, two new moving image works that uh, premiere in Berlin, and then they are actually being presented in solo exhibitions in other institutions, so not specifically with us. And uh, another associate curator is Tirdat Zolgada, what I already told you, who's more interested in, uh, who's more appointed as a sort of educational, pedagogical, experimental formats um, that he's uh, operating in. And both of them operate out of the institution, so, we're slowly, we're first trying to get the building structured as we like it to be, and then bit by bit we are going to like put our tentacles into the city. Because you know, KW finds itself in a beautiful courtyard, but that also mentally is uh, sometimes a bit suffocating. And I think specifically uh, as the sort of main center or main institute for contemporary art, I think the conversations need to reach in different areas in Berlin, and of course, as always, internationally. Now, I have a sort of ongoing love letter with an artist. Um, and the reason why I have this ongoing love letter, I guess the love letter, if, if, it, if you have to see this in pages, it's probably like 20 pages now, um, is someone that I always go back to because it's sort of a square one of, uh, of thinking. Specifically, if you, want to, if you want to talk about the function of an art institution, which very much is about communication, exchange, it's a social space, but in the end, it's always filtered through this idea of the artistic lens. Uh, at least this is what I believe. And then the person that uh, I always go back to is American conceptual artist Ian Wilson, who is, I guess, the most dematerialized artist alive. Um, and who, um, in 1968, decided to only produce work based on oral communication. Now, that started very, very basic by just walking with someone in the streets of Soho and then speaking about time, and then people would be saying, so what are you up to these days? And then he would be saying this, you know? And then they would be not understanding that they just had a conversation about time and that he considered that to be work. Later on, he started more institutionalizing or formatting these conversations by um, uh, setting up a, a, um, a very specific theme. Now, this was in the, in the 70s uh, because he was very much connecting uh, these radical sort of conceptual structures to spiritualism, and he uh, had a Zen master. So he's very interested in the known and the unknown, and time are actually all three factors that uh, are like one of the core elements in Zen theory. And then, so what he did is the discussions, which he calls them, they would only take place in group, or they would take place between two people, but they were not allowed to be recorded. So the only recording is if the discussion would be purchased. And if the discussion would be purchased, there will be a certificate saying there was a discussion and the time and date signed by him. And you have to imagine that this was in, uh, in the early 70s, and um, he's still doing this today. Now, 
for me, it was interesting to use Ian Wilson as a way to talk about, as a way of introducing, you know, human interaction because, you know, we're all looking at our phones. We're not, you know, this is a cliche, but it's just a fact. We're not social anymore. We're, we're very social with ourselves. We're very self-absorbed. And I was kind of interested in the idea of how human interaction and discussion can be filtered through the lens of conceptual art, which seems dated, but then still updated in regards to um, other artists responding to it and using this format. And so it was like a survey of Ian Wilson that unfolded over the course of four months. You have to imagine that he made nine physical works in his life, and uh, they would rotate. They would find themselves in different places. Um, the other three artists that you see in this list, Hannah Lippert, Adam Pendleton, and Paul Ellerman, all three people from different generations that, uh, like, I invited them first talking about Ian Wilson. First, we had long conversation about Ian Wilson, and based on that, they each developed either in complete new work or they developed their own solo show. Now, with Ian Wilson and with Hannah Lippert, which is the opening show exactly a year ago, here you can see a little bit uh, some of the things that we did. So as I told you, I completely removed all the walls and, and also gives you a bit of a different understanding of, of, uh, of space. For example, this vitrine that you see here is designed by Ian, which nobody knows, and we are actually using the future only Ian Ian Wilson designed uh, vitrines. Um, now, Hannah Lippert used, uh, Hannah Lippert is a younger artist, she's uh, 31 years old, uh, and she, I think, is a, a very unique uh, artist in, 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 in these days because she only operates with her voice. So she's, a, she's in a way, of she's in a way inspired by, by concrete poetry, but she also is very in, inspired by the idea of the language he used, how we cut our language through text messaging, et cetera, et cetera, but also how we you know, form ourselves through, uh, through advertisement, et cetera. So she used Ian Wilson as a way to, uh, to talk about time. Now, the last work that Ian Wilson made in 1968 is a chalk circle on the floor. And it's a, it's, a, it's a circle that everybody can do, but you have to ask for permission that it is uh, authorized by him. And she kind of used this idea of the circle, which for him, of course, is a representation of time as a wave of a continuous sort of, a, uh, yeah, a continuous format. And she wanted to connect this idea of the spirituality. So in a quite literal sense, she started dr drawing, and then she came into this spiral idea, this sort of spiral staircase which um, all of a sudden made you go to a part of KW's main hall that nobody looked at, which is the skylight room. So we made this staircase that you could go up with 20 people, people max. And on the left, oh, oh no, sorry, that's the next image. <laughs> um, if it works, yeah. Then you would come onto this, uh, this space, which was, one, was the height exactly her height, so she could stand and the rest could not, unless you were her height or smaller. And, um, and this was a 12-minute 12, 12 audio piece that would bring you outside, it would make you look again back into Mitte. So it would bring you out of this ex uh, extension that was built in the early 2000s. And the project was called Flash. And the second artist we opened was Adam Pendleton, which is a, an artist that very much looks at the idea of, of, of um, the construction of, uh, of, of language in regards to the representation of identity. Now, uh, he always refers to the idea of sort of like black history in regards to this, but I think what makes, makes Adam so interesting is that he always uses conceptual and poetry structures in order to, under, to, to, un, to undercut this idea of, of uh, an immediate discursive representation uh, of, of, of black politics. Um, so he built one, he basically made one wall that cut through, the, through the, one of the galleries. And uh, it had one sentence from Ron Silliman, which is an American poet, um, that says, um, God, what does it say? In order to express the world. I can't find a sentence, this is terrible. Anyway. Um, Rising, uh, I don't know what exactly, I forgot, right, is in order to express the world. So he used that sentence as a way to kind of uh, juxtapose things and became these sort of poster formats. And he also used uh, W.E.B. Uh, e. Du Bois um, as an inspiration who placed the, the, the question, 
how, what does it feel like to be a problem? So he kind of addressed that in his way of the, of the installation. And for me, this was also a way to kind of like introduce the complexity of language because the whole first season was about the construction of language, but also as a way to introduce politics uh, and specifically identity in that regard. On the other side of the wall, there was a monochrome work by Ian Wilson from 1966 that was destroyed and he had it reconstructed and a monochrome work, uh, black work from uh, Adam that was juxtaposed with this. Now, part of the program, this is also very much part of, of my profile as a curator, is um, introducing specific niche-oriented practices that I see people looking at. So artists, artists, I see that artists always refer to them, but they never get institutional acknowledgement. And one of the people is uh, Paul Elliman. Paul Elliman sits between being an artist and a typographer. And the graphic design typography context always refers to Paul as being one of the most radical people th while thinking about ways of finding communication. So instead of actually creating letters, he's someone that finds letters and kind of builds around that in regards to how technology has influenced our way of speaking and influenced our way of creating things. Now this, is, this exhibition was a sort of small survey of his work because we had to introduce that practice to people. A lot of people just didn't know what it was. For me, this was important because people like Hannah Lippert was like, you know, up and coming, interesting, working very much in the, in the Berlin scene. Adam Pendleton as someone that in America already established a, a career but had never had a solo show in Europe. And then Paul Elliman as a, as a very, you know, niche artist, artist focus. So all of these are kind of, we're all responding to Ian Wilson. So here you also see um, another work by Ian inserted that said, time spoken. And let me look if I don't speak too much, because I think I am, yeah, I'm kind of speaking too much. Um, now, one of the formats we, we introduced, because we work with these seasons, right? So the first season was very much around the construction of language and the notion of exchange and communication. And um, uh, I wanted to introduce this idea of, of showing a single artwork for a short amount of time in order to bridge one season with another season. So to have a moment where the institution just pauses and you can look into the main exhibition hall and experience an historical work, you can just concentrate on one single artwork for an X amount of time. Now the main hall of KW is a very big space, so it's also not cheap to do these uh, pauses, but for me it was important to kind of make this moment of like a single artwork. Um, so in this case, for example, Anthony McCall, uh, a line describing a cone when it's very original setting from 1972 was of course a beautiful way of also, you know, placing it into, uh, into the conversation of, uh, of the circle of Ian Wilson. Now, Germany has a, an enormous interesting uh, history in typography and graphic design, but there's actually no proper museum whatsoever in, in, in uh, Berlin dedicated to this. And uh, all the people that, as, I, as a curator, deal a lot with the construction uh, of language and the questions around that, um, I always speak a lot to graphic designers and typography. I mean, you will see also in the, that in the redesign of, the, of, of, of KW, how important that is for me, graphic design. And um, what I did is I, uh, we started introducing a format called a year with, where we spent a year with one typographer that we consider to be influential in, in, a, in a contemporary context and together discuss what kind of format we could do with this person. Now we just closed a year with Will Holder, who's a British typographer, very influential uh, on, uh, on a younger generation of graphic designers. And he also initiated the magazine FR David, which is a, a really beautiful journal, if you don't know it, um, which has been around for roughly seven years now and dedicates itself to, to construction of words and language. Now, FR David used to be published by the Apple and then it kind of, kind of got lost and I picked it up and now it's published with KW. And uh, Will decided to do a residency format where every month he would bring someone over and he would work with this person and then publish something. For him, publishing is not just on print. Publishing is many ways, like I'm doing now, is also publishing. You know, it's like public and it's a voice. So for him, he created all these sort of different formats throughout the year. 
was very small, very niche, very, it wasn't like a, you know, it was very specific focused audience. And that's exactly what I, what I what's, would like to talk about a bit later is this idea of this different focuses on different sort of ideas of audiences. We're not talking to one audience, we're talking to different, many different forms. So the year with is yet another sort of way of, of, of dealing with that. I am going to skip this. I mean, the only thing I can say about it is how we've operated in 2017, we won't operate in 2018 like this, is that instead of creating a discursive program for each season, uh, we used the budget in order to create new things, new productions. So we would explain the sort of theoretical frame of the season, and based on that, uh, we would invite an X amount of people to produce new work from different generations. So it's again this idea of like people looking at people, people studying people, people not knowing of other people, but actually being inspired by so. So it's like, it's just a way of like bringing people together. And this is how we've operated our public program the last year. So uh, for example, amongst others, Coco Fusco was part of the first uh, discursive, pro uh, discursive three, four months, was called The Weekends. Well, let me think if I should go all the way through with me. It's maybe kind of it's still okay, no? Conrad, you tell me if I have to shut up. <laughs> or maybe you guys just tell me shut up and that's fine. So, okay. So, we closed season one. You saw the pulse of Anthony McCall. And now we're in season two. And in season two, it was more about the idea of how the, this idea of the construction of politics through language, so how pol the birth of politics, I would say, in which one disagrees. So when the first season is about discussions, the second season is about disagreement. Um, in that sense that you know, disagreement leads to things around us, but it also leads to divisions in, 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 in different sort of uh, opinion making. And um, one of the people that I uh, really wanted to introduced to the larger audience is someone that completely disappeared off the scene, but it was extremely important in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, mostly in America, um, which is a, an artist that later on became uh, very important educationally, uh, Ronald Jones. Uh, Ronald Jones was uh, highly influential for a, a lot of different uh, artists, amongst other Matthew Barney, uh, Trisha Donnelly, uh, Jason Dodge. And Jason Dodge called me one day and said, you should do a show on Ronald Jones. And I said, well, you should curate it with me. So we decided to do a show on Ronald Jones. We called Ron if it would be possible. And uh, we wanted to update the work in regards to placing it in conversation with peers or with historical works that we consider to be important in regards to the politics today. So to look at the development of the last 150 years that have shaped the society and also have created all these different forms of fear. So it's kind of introducing the notion of xenophobia through objects. So just very briefly to give you an understanding of what's happening here in the main hall, um, the exhibition was surrounded by a work from 1936 from Herr Malersky, which is a, was a Swiss photographer who photographed, it, who photographed a Jewish draftman in um, Jerusalem for two weeks on a, uh, on a terrace, but used different photographic techniques. So what you see is 135 portraits of someone that completely changes all the time. So you'd see the different face of the, basically how a person could appear. And this idea of the morale is kind of very much part of this, of this exhibition and the construction of evil in that regards as well. So, I mean, what, what is very typical with Ronald Jones is that he always refers back to the history of art and the history of design. So, for example, Albert, Albert Speer, uh, um, uh, vases that he designed for the office uh, of, uh, of Hitler uh, which is filled with all the uh, poisonous plants uh, that one can get on the market. Uh, the Brancusi works are um, uh, mutations of cells uh, that either cause rapid, well, they cause uh, rapid developing cancers based on uh, uh, HIV infections. So there's all these sort of things that he addressed in the, in the, in the late, late 80s in, the, in, in his work. So you see some of those details on that. But we also introduced like the very first work of Julia Scher, you know, kind of inserted uh, fictitious, fictitious conversation in um, um, CCTV 
in an institution in the Wexner Art Center in, uh, in, uh, in the United States. So this idea also like of placing you back into the institution, but also placing you back into time was kind of playing, push and pulling that uh, in the exhibition. So this sort of became the foundation for the season, of which we went into Hiva Ka. Hiva Ka is uh, an artist that I get, I guess, got a lot of recognition this uh, last year because of um, various reasons. One of them could be that he was instrumentalized as a refugee, and uh, his work, uh, in a way, dealt with that. But actually, Hiva has been doing these works for the last 15 years. And when he um, was invited, I told him, "Let's do an exhibition where we try to show as much as possible of your work." We selected nine projects, and they kind of deal very much with the notion of belonging. So the idea of, of refuge, but also an understanding of what it means that you have to insert yourself somewhere else and also become part of a conversation that is so-called being accepted. So all of these things are kind of part of the work and uh, also very smartly constructed together, for him at least, I mean, how he makes these works. Um, and they sort of span the last 10 years. And that, so that with Hiva Kaur, it went into a very personal note, so it kind of sh went from the micro perspective, or macro, macro perspective into the micro, uh, by really focusing on, on the idea of migration and uh, from a very personal point of view. And then the exhibition we stacked on top of it was uh, also a mid-career survey of an Australian artist, uh, Nicholas Mangan, who very much deals with the idea of how um, yeah, basically, the economy of land, so construction of, 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 of colonialism, basically. The idea of, of exchange, and specifically through the lens of uh, Australia, where you have to imagine that, you know, people don't go off the road, because basically the country is ungraspable for the people living in Australia. And Australia has been very much part in the development and usage, in this case of Micronesia, where he concentrates very much on. So, and in the work of, of Nicholas Mangan, there's always a, a sort of like a, a closed circuit, which is really quite spectacular, how he operates and brings things back into the institutional setup. I mean, I'm not going too much into details here, but this was on, on the top floor. Let me see, because I think I'm already going too fast. But anyway, so the last season of uh, last year, we had a pause by Margaret Honda. Margaret Honda is a filmmaker, a uh, structural filmmaker, and she made a film where you slowly went through all the scales of colors in a 20-minute film. So you'd see here in the main hall, you had to book a ticket, and you would, go, you would go through the whole construction of, uh, of, uh, of, of the scale of, of, um, of color. And this is also a way to not just talk about something very, very formal like color. It was also a way to, to bridge the last season, which was Willem de Roy and Lucy Scare, which both got an invitation to to survey their work, and both kind of really were very inve investigating in the idea of representation through imagery. And Willem de Roy decided to concentrate on the work that he made in 1979, uh, 1997, together with his uh, then partner, uh, Jeroen de Rijke, um, where they went to a, uh, to, um, uh, Greenland and uh, for a month circulated around, around one iceberg and then Jeroen um, died in 2006 and Willem always remembered the sound of the of the of, of, of the, the dogs that lived in that village because there are more dogs in that village than there are people there are around 6,000 uh, around 6,000 dogs and 4,000 people and the dogs of course are the indigenous population but I don't know if you know the history of Norway of, of Greenland but it became it was very, it's still sort of part of the Danish kingdom but it uh, was also a colonial uh, colonized um, country and uh, slowly is now re-establishing his indigenous, indigenousness, I can't even say the word, where he basically um, used uh, the, 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 the communication between the dogs as a metaphor, as a way to talk about um, the idea of time and communication, but also the idea of the single voice. So in the main hall, you'd have a work that was exactly the same length as a film, but you have to imagine that there was 20 years between. So 
you know, there was a 20 year absence in the exhibition. So constant, it was talking about his practice by looking at something that is very abstract, which we don't really are immediately related to, which is Greenland, in this case also in, in regards to development of, of, of the climate. So you see that here. And as you can see, maybe also in these pictures, if you know KW, we you know we moved all the walls so you could just look outside of the whole, whole institution, and also kind of incorporate the history of this building because I didn't really understand the fight to make it a white cube. You know, it's a factory, let it be a factory and deal with it. So um, and also think then very closely in what kind of artworks you would place yourself in there. Now Lucy Scare is someone that's very much dealing with the idea of. Of, um, of mass production and how to find a, an autonomous uh, voice within that. And also always inserts a sort of personal story within that. Um, and I think she really almost made a site-specific installation in regards to surveying her own work, but also thinking about the fact that it's presenting itself in a factory. So she made this whole installation on the top floor, which, um, which was like literally grabbing into all the works and creating one new installation out of that and, and, and in including that in the complete floor of the, of the institution. Now the two small things that I'm gonna talk about and then I wrap it up. Um, you know, what I really love is when an institution, specifically the Berlin Biennial, we, we kind of started developing all these, so I call them like pets things that look like they were leftovers, but they're like artworks that we didn't dismantle or we just loved them and they became part of the environment of KW. And um, um, it started, for example, with the Dan Graham Pavilion, which became Café Bravo, which is our café, uh, which was uh, made for the first uh, Berlin Biennial. And, um, and it gradually grew into a collection of around 12 works. And I quite rapidly started adding more and more additional things because I quite like the idea of them, I see them as sort of punctuations of how you could think about environment, but also as a sort of conceptual uh, continuation of, of, of how you want to connect things within the building. Um, so one, for example, thing I did is, the first thing I did is um, uh, paint the door. Uh, it's a work by Philip von Snick, it's from 1984, it's called Day and Night, and it's a, a juxtaposition that he always works with in his work. He's a, He's a, a painter from Belgium, had started working in the 70s, and uh, has, has very strict rules of what he paints with. And I thought day and night is, of course, also a beautiful way of thinking about life, and also a way of how you open and close these doors. So this is one of the few things that we did. The other thing is um, we reintroduced uh, um, the Pogo Bar, which uh, in the late 90s, you know, uh, you could do a lot of illegal things at KW, but the more and more you get professionalized and institutionalized, the more you're being, people look at you, uh, the less you can do. And in the basement of KW, there used to be this club in the late 90s, early 2000s, where everybody went and it was, a, it was its own sort of social group. And I didn't want to mimic this, but I did like the idea of curating a social space. And, um, and we introduced the bar, uh, which is designed by Robert Wilhite, who is a set designer and artist from Los Angeles. And uh, the Pogo Bar operates in, in a way that every Thursday we ask a person to decide the rules of the game of the evening. Who performs, what's the music, what's the drink, who's allowed to come in, what shoes should you wear. I mean, it could be as fluxes as you want. And this is a little bit how the space completely turns all the time. And what's nice about this is that it tackles different small social groups. So every time there's a different audience because you kind of like, okay, well, I invited you and you have your friends and your friends have friends and this is how you kind of create moments of, of rupture, of social rupture, which I think is it's quite nice. And this is a way that we've slowly started establishing its own sort of uh, program. The other thing is the garden, which we reintroduced. We used to have the garden in the, in the early, in the mid 2000s. And, uh, and I kind of kept, with the, the ninth Berlin Biennial, reintroduced the garden and I kept it and we expanded it. Uh, it's by Atelier Le Balteau. They've been working at the, our courtyard for the last 15 years. So they're also kind of part of this social space. You have to imagine that everything in this courtyard is a sort of container. 
just like people living there since the 90s. The, there are little, little bureaus that have been working there since you know, 20 years. They hardly pay any rent. So it's like a little bubble in the whole development of Mitte. So at first we were like, you know, the gentrification, and now we're holding on to something. So it's kind of an interesting uh, bubble moment. Uh, and also a way to understand why are these people all in this space? Because I mean, I didn't understand the whole un uh, the constant change of, uh, we used to have a residency program, but I kind of killed it and really wanted to understand who's there and create a much clearer family within that right. environment. There are many, 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 I'm not gonna talk about all of them. You have an idea of, the, of the, some of the new entrants. I think I should wrap it up, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your presentation and, uh, and lecture. We went through almost a whole year, um, a whole year of, the, uh, of uh, KW. Uh, in 45 so, minutes. In 45 minutes, well done. Uh, so uh, now I open in the Q&A. Uh, if there is any questions, comments or Thoughts which you would like to share with us, uh, just raise a hand and I will come um, with, uh, with a microphone. So I would like to start with the public. If there is none, I will have one or two questions. But, yeah. None? So, okay, I will, uh, I will start. Maybe you will have later on. Um, through, through the presentations, um, uh, one of the things which rapidly coming back was the concept, conceptualization. And uh, my question is um, uh, how you will see the institution in nowadays in a rapid change in a, in a, in a global scale uh, to uh, introduce and make a comment on very significant and important global issues via conceptualization. It's quite a niche way to uh, make a commentary of the uh, nowadays situation where most of the institutions try to openly uh, make uh, uh, political or social statements. Yeah, I do this on purpose, as you can see. Mm -hmm. um, specifically because Berlin has a almost a cliche that everything needs to be political, everything needs to have that tendency. And for me, you know, I think it's, it's important that there's, there are many different voices and some of these voices can appear to be political, but that is decided by the artist. And I don't want to instrumentalize the artist into a sort of larger agenda. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, there is an agenda for the institution, but if I want to speak about refuge or if I want to speak about uh, environmental issues, I would ask an artist that I think in a very interesting, smart way will deal with these things instead of building a program that underlines that. Now, this sort of stubbornness in the program is slowly developing uh, and landing, I think, because you, know, you also have to understand in the landscape of Berlin, there are different sort of institutions. And for me, there's no competition whatsoever, but I also need to understand what is the, you know, which, which contribution, which function does each of these institutions have? Now, as I said, it's an artist-driven program, and I want it to be an artist-driven institution. So that means that every issue that is being addressed, because I think if I actually walk through the program of last year, I think we addressed mm. enough political issues, but they're all filtered through these other people. And for me, that is, that's kind of crucial. So how do you see the impact of uh, artistic approach uh, to the program? And uh, I will keep in this area of political and social issues. Uh, how you see their impact on the future uh, development of an institution? And when you say that uh, uh, very beginning of the of your lecture, the issue of gentrification, and uh, I recognize yourself as a curator and director, uh, uh, as a kind of director of the situation to change the perspective on the gentrification and the situation of, uh, of uh, institution itself. And what is the impact from the artistic uh, participation for you as a director? In terms of instrument, uh, in yeah. terms of In terms of building the program of the institution and developing the program of the institution. In, 
with gentrification or or like in the gentrification is one of the issues which you would like to as you say to uh, I mean to I develop. mean uh, as I said for me there's like many different layers of how I want the institution to operate so some of the projects are, are long term they have their own specific focus so one of them is called Realty, which uh, deals with the idea of gentrification, but also connects it to, for example, Athens and mm -hmm. Tehran. So there's like different sort of, it's a larger, more international conversation. Um, and it is not immediately operating as an exhibition format. So mm -hmm. what I said at the beginning of the lecture is for me, it's very clear, you know, this is an institution with a primary focus of exhibition making, but of course it's an institute and it has many different layers of investigation and also, you know, has what I only briefly tackled, this mm. very enormous focus on production, um, which not only with the moving image autonomy, product, you know, autonomy of moving image productions, but also with each exhibition, there's an, always a new amount of uh, uh, productions. Um, I, I think the, the, the conversations are all very specific. So if we want to talk about gentrification, then it's a slow burner, you know, because it's very easy. Everybody talks about it in Berlin and it's very cliche, but it's a way to also understand of how this conversation um, can thrive in a more productive way. And that's why, you know, Tierdot is setting up this, as I said, this three year long uh, format, which also has things, art in public space, there's many different layers of that. But, you know, um, there's, there's, these things are at this point quite invisible. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're very internally developed. And for me and for the institution mostly, it's now more important to give a certain clarity to, okay, this is how the exhibition program operates and this is what kind of function it is. Um, I think that people have to get used to the fact that discursivity is completely filtered through this uh, artistic lens. Um, but I feel that that this is exactly what is lacking, you know, because everything is always so deeply, you know, contextualized mm -hmm. and explained. And I want things to have a more sort of a autonomous uh, position in that respect. Is there any uh, question? Yeah. Uh, you were nominated uh, in July 2016. And how do you think, how much time do you need to implement uh, your uh, vision of the institution? And also, uh, have you met any positive uh, reaction from public or the city of Berlin uh, to, to uh, just now, uh, after your... Uh, uh, after a year? Yes. Um, wait, first to answer your first question. How uh, long? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, very, it's very practical. I, um, I don't know if it is practical. Well, I mean, the issue is that, that like, the, the, uh, the practical in the regards that, you know, the vision is also very much connected to the institution, to, 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 to the site itself. So, you know, we're now facing a two-year renovation, which has been, again, delayed by eight months, you know? So that's why I said very practically, if it would have not been delayed, I would say in three years to four years' time, I think we're pretty much somewhere solid from which we can operate. Um, now I, I don't know exactly how to say that. Um, as I said, it's step by step, but I think we already did an enormous amount of work internally and also externally in terms of the institution. But um, I think, let's say, give it three, so give it another two to three years where, uh, where I think the, the, the institution needs to be. And to answer your second question, um, you know, yeah, that's so that's that's so subjective. You know, so I mean, people say yes, wonderful. Other people say, you know, it's a it's a it's a city. Berlin is a city um, that's often critical for the sake of criticality. Um, I don't think we had you know we've been welcomed thus far with the program with the position, but I find it really I find it's hard to answer your question by saying yes, it's amazingly successful because I'm not the type of person to do that. I think that. In Dutch, you say "cut at the bone, kijk." Um, you know, sort of um, people are a bit held back and, and having a look at how things are going, and from there maybe form an opinion. I don't know. And your cooperators are mainly uh, German, or uh, the staff is international now? The staff? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a mix. It's international and and and, and, and local. Uh, 
Anyone else? Um, what are your strategies of connecting to the audience wider than just intellectuals and middle class? Do you have different strategies of how to connect to an audience wider than just art professionals and like, people with knowledge of like sociology, philosophy and stuff? Like, how do you make the institute attractive for like, the society as a whole? I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I see your point. Actually, um, I, I'm, I kind of believe in it the other way around. So I kind of believe in first building trust again within, uh, I mean, there's a, it's an institution with also a certain kind of uh, not a, a stable, uh, it's not been, a, you know, it's been a bit up and down in terms of per perception. For me, the focus now is very much geared to building uh, trust from the community of Berlin into the institution so that people also keep coming, keep coming, mostly in this case, the artists and everybody gets inspired. And from there, you build a more solid, uh, solid uh, audience. For now, the audience is growing, but it's based, you know, if we actually do an investigation on it, it is an enormous amount of tourism and it's an enormous amount, which is fantastic, a lot of young people. So there's a lot of, you know, curious young people that come. But um, just to, just to uh, continue answering your question, so the first and foremost focus at this point for me are, is the uh, is the build a, to create a certain kind of trust towards the community, and from there, you know, bit by bit, things grow into a larger audience. KW is um, is very honestly, it's a very specific organization. At the same time, people do know it in Berlin, but it's not. I don't think we do, I don't think we want to operate in a level that we're going to scream please here we are. So that's why I kind of started dividing the program in different audiences. So you know specific focuses for the educational program which I haven't even spoken about today has a very active political profile that operates in seven different districts in, in Berlin. That's an audience. The bar in the basement which all the time works with different guests and different hosts attracts different people to come. You could say that maybe that's only art world. Maybe it was in the last year, but maybe in the next two years, we'll invite much more people from outside of that context. But that's another way of like having a very specific social space. Then you have the very standardized exhibition formats, where what I reintroduced is that we, what Willy is very strong in Berlin, which I love, is the still the poster billboarding uh, way of circulating information, flyers and stuff, which normally in a lot of cities is dated. But in Berlin, it actually works very well, so we started doing that again, which of course attracts a lot of other people. Um, so there's different strategies, but for me, this is step by step. It doesn't work immediately like, oh, this and this and this and this, how we do it. I mean, we, didn't, we did a research uh, around five years ago, which is a big book about our audiences and how we, you know, and I kind of wanted to start again by the beginning and from there, see how, uh, what kind of roads we go down. Anyone else? Uh, first of all, thanks for the uh, very concise, surprisingly concise uh, talk, and uh, really interesting. I'm just wondering, uh, you've used a lot of, um, you used the word curating a lot of times and directing and even curating a social experience in the bar. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you want to open up to the community, how much freedom, or how do you curate freedom within the space of KW? How much um, is the experience of going to KW directed by you and your colleagues, or the artists, and how much kind of freedom of interpretation does a visitor get? It's a very good question because I should have addressed that because it's exactly exactly what we're working and playing with. So there's different ways of engagement with the institution. So we're not shoving this concept, this this sort of this concept down your throat. So how it works is that you you at least this is how we operate now. There are different forms of didactics and different forms of communication. So what I did, um, which is new, it's kind of new, I guess. I don't know any colleague that has that. Um, we trained um, permanent guides. So 
you have guards in institutions, and the guards sometimes also can tell you something about the exhibition or about the work that they're guarding. But um, uh, we started training uh, guides that also speak different languages. And they all have the complete freedom to interpret the exhibition. So they get a, a, a thorough walkthrough by us, and then based on that, they can make their own story. So, that's, uh, so when you come in, you pay a ticket, you get either a curatorial text that you can read if you're in the mood for it, you can decide to go in conversation with a guide, which is free if offer, or you just walk in. And when you just walk in, you're confronted by the fact that you're just there with the artworks without having read the concept. There's no wall text, there's no labeling. There is a floor plan in your booklet. So there is a way of being lost on different levels and there's a way to be over flooded with information. It's depending on how you engage. You also have to, as you might have seen, you know, these exhibitions might look very difficult at the beginning, and that's exactly what I want. I want you to have this idea of like, what the fuck is that, you know? Where the, the artworks and the space are very much sort of um, integrated with the architecture and everything sort of in a way from, from, a, from a sort of gut feeling makes sense and makes you intrigued. And based on this being intrigued, you can open up and, and, and find ways. But there are also many people I speak to that don't even read the text, they just enjoy being in the space. They enjoy what they see, they make their own interpretations of it, and then they leave, or they take it home and they read it at home. That's also the didactics that we give are in a way designed that they look semi-precious, you know, that you would like to collect them or you'd like to have them because they just, you know, they're a bit more than just a copy sheet. Um, so f so th these are like different ways of, 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 of communicating to an audience. And I think specifically you have to imagine that, you know, you're on Auguststrasse in Berlin, if you already had the nerve to walk into that courtyard, which is, you know, you think, oh, it's beautiful, it's the summer, you know, you have to imagine there's this nice terrace, and then you have to find KW, which is in the back. You know, you found it, you opened the door, you paid a ticket. You know how much steps that already is for a regular audience, you know? So there's like also ways for us to think about the fact that, okay, this is already a really hard decision for people. Because you have to imagine what happens also a lot with us, I didn't even say, is that one of, this building is one of the oldest buildings in Mitte. So we have, there's a lots of tours uh, in, the Jewish in the Jewish district, and there's, I don't know how many people come every day in that courtyard to get an explanation of that building. And then, of course, the, the person says, and now it's a Kunstwerk, a Center for Contemporary, or an Institute for Contemporary Art. And that already is vague, you know, like that sentence, Institute for Contemporary Art. If you're not into this world, I have no idea what that means. You know, so there's, there's ways of how we are going to engage with that, but that's not established yet. Is there any uh, question? We steeply uh, move to the end of the uh, tonight's, uh, tonight lecture. But yeah, last chance to uh, ask a question. Um, if not, thank you very much for your presence and your lecture. Thank I you. would like to uh, thank you as well, uh, Getta Institute, for uh, make this lecture happen. Thank you very much for your for your support, and uh, I would like to welcome you for tonight gala of uh, uh, Bank Pekao uh, competition and uh, for our lecture program for uh, next week to uh, 23rd of uh, January of the Gotton Kroyong uh, uh, discursive program start at 6 o'clock. Thank you very much and have a good evening. <laughs>